Thank you, Bruce, and thank you, folks, very much. <clears throat> I know the fellow just got weak in the voice before he even gets going. Now, that's kind of a bad sign. <laughs> it's good to see you. I, I thoroughly enjoyed a, a brief respite out on the, the gray rocks of Dover. <laughs> <laughs> That is a that's a physical awakening to go down there and let that sea breeze come at you. That, that'll get to you. Uh, I am delighted to be here and uh, be back at Jekyll Island. I told Bruce I didn't even know this part of the island was here. I, I thought this was water down here. I didn't know that they had all the opulence and splendor hid right out here in the boonies. Uh, let, let me tell you this, just sort of a, a general tone of, of, uh, of where I want to go. And, and first and foremost, uh, I want to be uh, uh, really informal as much as possible. And now, now Jerry's got this thing rigged up so that I can't move, so please don't throw any dangerous objects or anything. I don't have a fighting chance. i got to stay here. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that'll help. That'll help a great deal. Uh, but I, as much as we can in this in this church row setup, uh, I would really like to be informal, and uh, uh, it, it would be absolutely impossible to throw me off track because I am absolutely clueless about where we'll go. There ain't no telling. <laughs> And it'll have something to do with drinking and not drinking and recovering and kind of enjoying not drinking, I, I guess would be the general thing. And uh, so, so feel free is the message. Just feel free to jump in any time. If you go by something that, uh, <laughs> that uh, a little too quick, just, just say, whoa, you know, and if something that doesn't make sense, just say so. And, and uh, feel free to, to do that. I think it'd be great. I, I don't know about you, but I've noticed over the years that there's a, a very direct relationship, an absolute relationship, between what I put in and what I get out. You hear it all the time in Alcoholics Anonymous, but, but you can absolutely count on it that the more I get involved in the meeting, the greater the meeting is. And so by all means, be selfish you know, and, and uh, use the time, use the thing. What, what we are, I guess, I mean, we're just meeting, many of us are just meeting, but we're a bunch of folks, uh, alcoholics, or uh, is every, everybody alcoholic? Are, are there some that are just family? They're, they're families that, now there's the real problem. Yeah, ne <laughs> never mind the alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> family, that, living with one of us, putting up with one of us, Jesus. <laughs> what an order. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. I wanted you all to see that sweater. <laughs> i tell you how family works. i, I, I tell you how family works. The wife and I were, were on, on a beautiful Jekyll-like night in Georgia, up in uh, Helen, Georgia. Colder than a witch's tit. It, I mean, it was cold. And uh, my wife from Canada, she didn't think she would notice the cold. That girl was shaking. And I said, come on, we'll go down and buy something. <laughs> now, no reflection about family. We go downtown and shop all over Helen, Georgia, and she buys me two sweaters. <laughs> Is there something goofy with that picture? She's still shaking. <laughs> That's my symbol of surrender. <laughs> To the, to the logic that prevails. So I, uh, I can't explain it. I just observe it in awe. And, and so I'm glad you're here. <laughs> uh, so, so informality and casualness is uh, order of the day for me. And uh, the other thing that I, I like to think about this is that you know, what we're enjoying here is, is a unique experience. You mentioned that folks will be kind of drifting in. It's a unique experience. The group that gathers here this weekend will be a one-time deal. It'll be a group that will never meet again in the history of the world. Because once we assemble, 
we don't come back. You know, I mean, we may, who knows what will happen by the time we meet next year. Some of us will be gone. I mean, that's one reason they got me this year. When a guy's got, <laughs> guy's got 45 years, you don't want to plan too far ahead. <laughs> so you never know what's going to be uh, in, the, in the cards for the, for the future. If we called a break, somebody would get an emergency phone call and have to go. Or somebody would throw in the towel and say, man, I've had enough. I can't handle any more tonight. And, and so we are, it's a one-time deal. And, and I surely hope that, that me and you as well can use this opportunity to gather what we can from each other. I was just glancing a little bit at the folder. There's something in there about that thing of how we sort of feed each other and support each other. And that's a lot of what we do here this, this, this weekend. And so I want to kind of treasure this moment as a time when some humans come together Folks who come from all kinds of backgrounds. The thing I always like to remind myself of at an AA meeting is that there's nobody here on a cut-rate ticket. And I'm not talking about the price of the condo. There's nobody here on a, price, on a cut-rate ticket. Everybody here is in a seat that they paid dearly for. It doesn't matter whether it's the alcoholic or the family or a friend or even an observer who cared about us. There are no, no, no cheap seats in this place. We're folk who have looked death bang in the eyes, the poet said, and came back. We're folk who have known bondage as few people know bondage. We're folks who have known deep pain, deep hurt. We're folks who have known loneliness peculiar to any loneliness in the world. So uh, the dues have been paid here. You know, no cheap seats in this place. And so we are a, a kind of a, a strange group gathered, and I'm just, just really glad to be, be one of the crowd. The, uh, the basic, I think the way, way I'd like to go at it, one is uh, you're probably not going to learn anything radically new and earth-shaking uh, I have learned a lot radically new and earth-shaking since I've been in AA. We don't change much. We are a place where repetition is a rule of the day. Uh, we learn by road almost. And, uh, and more importantly, we learn so much not from teaching and instruction. Alcoholics Anonymous, I believe, is, a, is, 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 is an experience in experiential learning. In this program, we learn by doing, not by teaching. You know, and, and so... The guy that's here tonight is, is no learned cat about the program. I'm no expert on anything. If I quote anything specifically out of the book, it'll be a lie. It'll, it'll flat be a lie. <laughs> they, I just wing it. You know, I, I mean, I know what it says, but I can't get the words together. I'll probably get them close enough that you can figure it out if I quote anything. But I'm not a technically oriented person. You know, I'm not somebody who can quote chapter and verse. I don't know what page nothing's on. <laughs> I really don't. I do. And don't care. I mean, you know, I have a lot of fun looking for it. <laughs> so that, that won't be my approach, you can be sure. Uh, I, I like to do, uh, when I do these things, I like to do it on kind of that spirit. I, I like to do it on the basis of experiential-based stuff. I, I didn't bring a book. Has anybody got a book with them? That, yeah, you did. Just wrote on it. Now, if I could read it, is that an AA book? Sure, at Founders Day. My God, you can't get much more AA than that. The, uh, there's a place in here. You know, it's funny how you find stuff, eh? Funny how you find stuff. I was working with a new guy, and uh, he had been around Alcoholics Anonymous for 17 years. Former, well, I shouldn't say what he was. He, well, he was a spook. He, he was in the CIA, and uh, I guess maybe he approached AA like it ought to be a great secret or something. 17 years. <laughs> Had a lot of trouble. And he'd just come out of treatment. I said, all right, I'm going to work with you a little bit. And I was absolutely amazed before I was halfway started with this guy. <laughs> I don't think he had ever gotten past 
the, 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 the film that covered the book in terms of any understanding of what was going on. And so we started going through. We've been a month and haven't even got out of the introduction of the doc's opinion. Never mind the content of it. And I saw a line in there when it, it, showing him, I showed me. If I can find this thing, it's absolutely profound, whatever it is. <laughs> it's, a, it's a place... Oh, dumb. Now, isn't this silly? Uh, uh, give me just a minute now. And uh, now This is not indicative of how I normally do business. I'm usually like a running train, and when I invite you to get in on it, if you decide to get in on it, you better be serious because I'm not somebody who plays with the group or teases or leaves great pauses. I uh, mean, I just get started, and I either quit I always I like to time my quitting pretty precisely. I like to quit about five or six minutes before the group quits. There's <laughs> nothing lonelier than to be speaking to a group and they quit on you. <laughs> Nobody needs to tell you. I mean, you can just see it. The glaze just comes over the eye. <laughs> and they just sit there, you know, kind of looking. You can talk all night. But you ain't kidding nobody but yourself because it's done. It's, after, it's always like to beat that in just a couple of minutes. And, and the other thing is that I promise you I'll quit time to get on my airplane. Because my wife will flat kill me if I don't. Oh, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. I, I, I want to build up a lot of anticipation. Oh, here you go. Here you go. What, what this guy's talking about, and it's part of what flavors the way I like to approach stuff like this. It, it, what he's saying is this: We doctors have have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology, this isn't the heavy part yet, was of urgent importance to alcoholics. But its application presented difficulties beyond our recognition. What? Now, here's the part that really says something to me. What with our ultra-modern standards, our scientific approach to everything, we are perhaps not well equipped to, the, to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. Let me read that one more time. I really think there's a message in it. What with our ultra-modern standards, our scientific approach to, to every, everything, we are par perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. Heart and soul of Alcoholics Anonymous is one alcoholic sharing from his heart with another alcoholic. That's the heart and soul. It has never been about wisdom, and it probably never will be. It's about one human being connecting and caring heart to heart about another. And, and so, so when I approach stuff, you know, like we're doing here, one of my great prayers is that I not get teachy, that I not get teachy in the approach, that I not get away from the, the, fun, the fundamental origin of what this recovery is about, and that's how it works in, in, in our own lives. And so that's the reason you'll see me stay very, very... If you don't see me staying very, very closely to that spirit... Remind me of what I just said, will you? Because I'll be a guy that's headed out to a, to a, to a zone that I don't want to get in. Uh, and thank you very much, Ron, for the book. So be very much in that spirit. What we'll do tonight when I get through messing around with you is, is uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about drinking and throwing up and square dancing and stuff like that. And uh, <laughs> cutting fighting, running away from home, all kind of stuff. And I'm going to tell a story, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll deliberately not get into too much of the, uh, the real dynamics of recovery, but more just the kind of social part of, of recovery, about you know, how it happens. And then the rest of the weekend will be about that program of recovery. 
And so uh, tonight is just kind of a howdy do session. Yeah, you know, I want to I want to let you sort of know who's going to be messing with your time here for a little while. Now, who is this dude? And so I'd like to sort of, I guess in a way, establish my credentials. <laughs> That's a terrible way to put it, anyway. What? <laughs> I had a guy introduce me one night. I don't know where he got it, but he had my professional resume. And he introduced me at an AA meeting with my professional resume. Can you imagine that? I was never so shocked, clumsy in my life. It took ten minutes to find commonality with that group. My God, they thought I was going to lecture on etiology of alcoholism or something when they got through with that. <laughs> so I'll introduce the credentials. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll take off into uh, to, uh, some rough approximation to what's laid out on the schedule. Uh, Jerry and I were talking about it on the way down. I, I'm not somebody who, who likes to get real terse and cut and dried with stuff. Yeah, I like to let stuff run its course. And so if we're if we're into something and we run the course quick, we'll move on. And if we don't run the course quick, we just sort of hang out. And so that's the way. I would rather spend the whole weekend on two steps that had real value and meaning than the, the, everything including traditions and concepts if, it, if it's not doing anything. So uh, that's the basic thing. I, I'm a guy who... Um, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I, I, I'm absolutely no question whatsoever about that. Had enormous questions about that when I came in AA, as, as many do, and I had really serious questions. I came in as, as uh, you can tell, old as I look now. You can tell I must have got here fairly young, and I did. I was 24 when I came to AA, and in, in 1956, when somebody suggested it to me, in 57, when I finally got there, I, I went in February 2nd of 57. And uh, didn't have a clue what it was going to be. Had never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I didn't even know what its purpose was. I caught on real quick. I mean, it doesn't take too long to figure out what these folks were about. I mean, they were about not drinking. And they were serious as a heart attack about it. I could tell that. They were talking about not drinking one day at a time. But I knew they were lying like a dog. <laughs> they meant not drinking forever. And Jesus, that sounded now that might have sounded like a thrilling mission to you, but it didn't sound thrilling to me. I, you know, a lot of the time when I first came in AA, my thought was, "Oh my God, what if this thing works?" <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to get struck bone dry. <laughs> and from the tone of things, thought, "Jesus, I'll never have fun again the longest day I live." And I could just see my whole life stretching out like a long gray tunnel. I, I thought life was done for me if this thing kicked in. And uh, so I, I was not a great prospect. I didn't believe I was an alcoholic. I was the youngest guy in every meeting I attended for a number of years. Youngest member in my entire state. And I'll tell you, that's a nice feeling when you look back on it. But it ain't hitting on much when you're in the throes of it yet. Now, we can talk about identifying rather than comparing all we want to, but that's a lot of conversation. Because when you're sitting next to somebody who outweighs you 25 years in drinking, you're going to compare. <laughs> and you're going to come up short. Uh, I felt like a, a beat-up wimp, but I felt like a, a, a wimp sitting in there next to some of those folks. And of course, they did everything they could to make me comfortable. And I, I still look young. Most people don't think I'm 80 years old. And uh, I hope. <laughs> and, and folks were incredibly kind. You know, I'd, I'd have folks walk up, how old are you, boy? <laughs> well, I'm 24, sir. My God, you going to quit drinking? <laughs> they, they, well, I was kind of thinking about it. <laughs> Oh, man, you don't know anything about drinking, man. I'm just getting started when I was 24. I really encourage you. Yeah. <laughs> Went to a meeting one night at, uh, Dur at Durham, you know, where Duke University is. Now, I was really kind of messing with the gal, but, but there was a, a, a sweet old lady with a bird feather hat on came over and uh, really trying to be nice and nosy. 
And she uh, introduced herself, and I introduced myself, and she said, Are you somebody's son? <laughs> I said, Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. <laughs> and she said, No, no, I mean, uh, is, are your parents in, here in the program? And I said, No, no, they're not. She said, oh, are you a student over at Duke? And I said, no, no, I'm not. And I just played around with you. I never did tell her anything. And she finally gave up. And uh, then I got up and spoke. <laughs> she, she didn't have any question when, when I got through. But those were awkward times. Eh? And, and so yeah, I was a guy who didn't, didn't really believe he was an alcoholic. And then I gradually, grudgingly accepted about, we'll talk a lot about that tomorrow. But I, I finally got into it a little bit. And then today, when I look at my alcoholism, and I, I haven't done this for a long time, but I, I want to just kind of lay this out a little bit because I think it's sort of a groundwork for, for, for how recovery fits at least into my life. You know, when I look at my alcoholism now, it looks to me like it happened in a, in a, in a, in a, in a in I, I gather, a fairly predictable kind of way. You know, I got I got sick in a in a kind of a series of of of, of developments that happened in my life. Yeah, you know, and and when I got sick, when I look back at it after I started understanding something about the illness, you know, I recognize the first place that I got sick was spiritually, and and our book reinforces this quite often that the spiritual malady of alcoholism, that emptiness that so many of us talk about, that spiritual dilemma that, that, that is alcoholism. Certainly that was where it happened for me, and I won't go into a lot of detail on it, maybe, but I was a guy who uh, grew up in, in uh, you know, kind of a fervent brand of Bible Belt religion, and my family were, uh, were enormously involved in that, and, and they t tended to do well. Most of the people in that did well. But I'm a guy for whom it did not take. I'm somebody who, as a small kid, found most of that difficult to believe. I was a guy who found an awful lot of conflict, a lot of frustration, a lot of fear, a lot of guilt, a lot of, of uncertainty in that whole area of spirituality. And I'm talking about as a preschool youngster. Now, I don't know if you've had that experience or not, but you imagine the mind of a child wrestling with calling to question something as omnipotent, as fearsome-sounding as God. And so that was a, the seedbed of my alcoholism. What set up in that thing with me was, well, was a kind of a dual existence where I had ideas and beliefs and feelings that were too scary to share. They were too scary to face. And so what I had was a guy who believed and felt one way on the inside, acted quite another way on the outside. And that ran the course from frustration and fear to anger and guilt and then finally cold indifference. And when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, I had absolutely no spiritual life whatsoever. I didn't know their our Father nor have any concern about it. If there was any God, I didn't like Him much. And I was one of those who did the great debates, well, if there's a God, why do so many cruel things happen? And all of the stuff that goes on. But that was the seedbed in which my alcoholism started. Didn't particularly cause it, but that was the seedbed. When I look back to where it sprung, that was the place. And then the next thing that grew out of that was the emotional illness. That, that thing of how I felt and how I... How I functioned in life, you know, the kinds of feelings I had about my place in life. I, I, I developed emotionally in a way that I was a guy that had a lot of anxiety, had a lot of fear, had a lot of tension. I had a lot of isolation. And I think they all kind of grew as a package deal. That was the alcoholism in the making. You know, I, I developed those kinds of characteristics in that kind of inner turmoil of my life. And, and so emotionally, I got into a very, very isolated, withdrawn kind of guy. Now, you wouldn't have known that because I also developed some other tendencies, we call them character defects, about how to act out ways that dispute that and make it look different. And I became the loud guy, boisterous guy, a daredevil, the kind of guy that would do anything on any whim, 
but I never felt that way. I was a guy who grew up with what you hear in Alcoholics Anonymous all the time, that sense of being unwilling or unable to hook up with other people, unwilling or unable to let people into my life or to really get to know people. And so that emotional kind of a thing led to that kind of awkward, uncomfortable isolation. And along in my, in my, um, in my uh, 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 teenage years, uh, I started to dabble a bit with booze. And I started serious drinking at 16. And when I started serious drinking, I found something that had really magnified importance in my life because I found a solution to that. I found something that gave me a sense of comfort, a sense of well-being, a sense of confidence, a sense of fearlessness. I would have been stupid to not drink. That stuff did a lot for me. I'm a socially dysfunctional kind of a guy. I can't get it going. I find something that for a couple of bucks will get me out of the prison of my life. Man, alive. I took to that thing big time. And I understand why. I don't even question it today. Booze really did something special for me. It was a lot better than psychiatry. I, it worked better. It was a lot cheaper, a lot more fun, and it worked awfully well. It, some people call booze a social lubricant. <laughs> and that's a pretty good description. It lubricated me awfully well. And, and man, I lied. I was, uh, it made me slick, really. I just got greasy. I was so lubricated. I, <laughs> and, and so I, I, you know, I just found what I needed and got into the business of living with gusto and loved that thing with a purple passion. So socially, you know, booze did a great deal for me. And enough that, had it not been for the fact that I developed alcoholism, I would be drinking today because that stuff was a magnificent force in my life. Booze was a solution for me. Unfortunately, it became a lousy solution. But unlike a lot of people you hear say that, that booze never quit working for, or that booze did quit working for them, it never quit working for me. It just worked overtime. It, 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 did, it worked too hard. And that stuff had more baggage than solution. But had that not happened, I would have never stopped drinking. Why would I? I had a lot of people tell me I ought to stop drinking. I never could think of a good reason to do so. Quit drinking and what? Be like them? <laughs> Jeez, drunk was bad enough. I never had seen anybody that didn't drink that I wanted to be like when I grew up. Everybody I ever saw who didn't drink looked like they didn't drink. They look like they're in pain. You know, I mean, God knows, rigid. You know, some people really ought to drink. They really should. They, I mean, seriously, some people got no business sober. Now, now I'm not talking about alcoholics, but have you been around people that, I mean, God knows, they, they, you know how it is when somebody scrapes down a, a, a chalkboard? And you just... Some people make me feel like that. I mean, they're so uptight that I just, I'd buy them a drink in a heartbeat, a big drink, you know, <laughs> provided they drink it right then. You know, they, they, I mean, some folks need it. My wife's one of them. I, and I know that, I know Marie will tell her, but my wife, she's been down here 37 years, <laughs> something like from Canada. But she grew up in the prairies, and she was, she's one that posed for that cornflake box, you know, that, <laughs> that is, oh, she's a pretty girl, but she is a, a little tight, I mean, that girl is a little tight, and uh, they're, those folks tend to be reserved anyway from up there, and she certainly fits the breed, Now she's getting better. She's learning to speak Southern, and, and she's showing great progress, but, but she's still a wet blanket I, when it comes right down to it. But yeah, if we go to a party, I swear to God, I have to explain the jokes on the way home. 
she never knows. But you let that old sister get a couple of drinks, look out. Man, like she's telling the jokes. <laughs> and she really treats her husband real nice. When, uh, when she... <laughs> well, well, that's why I'm talking about some people, I try to get her to drink. And she's tried, but I, I, she's about quit because I, I've tried so hard to teach her that it just aggravates her when... Uh... But anyway, that... <laughs> I, I, I think you get the picture. That I, I am not a prohibitionist. You know, I'm, I'm all for drinking. I, uh, not for me uh, or you, <laughs> but, but, but I'm all for drinking for folk that, that are, are not of our breed or are not quite here yet. Uh, I used to be the bartender for my company parties. I, I was the only guy sober, you know, and so I was a bartender. But they started noticing that folks were getting extremely drunk at, at the party. And when you find the head of the corporation, the head of the organization, dancing on his knees, you get a little suspect. You know? So they started tracing it back in their drunken logic and found me. <laughs> well, I always figured if people said they wanted a drink, they meant it. And, so, <laughs> and I, I mean, I'd, I'd knock them out in a heartbeat. That's, <laughs> I have absolutely, I have no, no, no uneasy feelings about that. I just sort of consider that my personal recruiting program for, for AA. In fact, some of them did come in AA. Some of them didn't. Some of them went out the other way. But they, uh, anyway, I, I, I don't feel bad. That's where our membership comes from, is people like that. So, I, so that's who it was. You know, I was that kind of guy. I found a marvelous solution in that, and it always gave me what I wanted. And until it became a greater problem. And strangely enough, the thing that freed me from that sort of social prison, don't you leave, Ron. We're getting to the good stuff, buddy. <laughs> the thing that freed me from that prison of my life, that, that spiritual, emotional, social prison of my life, the thing that freed me became the bars of the tightest prison I was to ever know. Because when I crossed that line and lost the ability to control my drinking, what at one time had made me the social animal, the life of the party, started to become the thing that disrupted everything I did and started to interfere with every function, every friendship. I became the guy that was constantly the puzzle to people. What's wrong with this guy? Yeah. I went on a party one night back when I was still socializing with folks, and, and I only got just a little bit confused. I had a blind date that I'd never seen, and, and I got just a little bit confused, got the wrong woman, <laughs> and it was the wife of the host of the party. I, I, this guy was about ready to kill me. I didn't even know he was mad. I was having a good time, but nobody else was. And so that kind of behavior over and over and over started to be the thing that isolated me from people every possible way you could think of. And what at one time had freed me became the glass wall of a prison that I lived in absolutely. A prison in which I no longer could even artificially relate to people but a prison that totally isolated me that I couldn't get out of and nobody else could get in. And I started to have all kinds of breakdowns socially. All kinds of them. I got to the point that I couldn't sustain friendships. I could not keep commitments. I mean, most people who knew me wouldn't even ask me to make one. I couldn't keep one on a bed. I started to get unemployed on a regular basis and finally darn near unemployable. I started to get into lots of difficulties. Now, I've never been a, been, been a, a, a criminal by nature. I've never been a thief or, or something like that. But I was just kind of a social deviant, I guess you'd call it. I was just a guy that, that got into an awful lot of trouble, not so much by what I did, but what I was. Uh, I was I was kind of like the folks say about cockroaches that 
that we don't get mad at cockroaches because of what they do. We get mad at them because of what they fall in and mess up. And that's kind of the way I was with life. It wasn't so much what I did. It was what I fell in and messed up. And so I, I started to go to jail with sickening regularity. And, and it was always the same thing. It drunk, it mooching around, whatever, just, just, uh, just, just some kind of goofy street behavior. Uh, I have no earthly idea how many times I've been in jail. I, I, don't, I wouldn't even venture a, 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 a guess. I like to think that I've been in jail the exact right number of times. <laughs> and I don't need to explain that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I haven't been as many as one time. I was down in, in New Orleans one time, and a guy, a judge, ran a, uh, what he called an honor class. I think there's some down in South Florida that uh, 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 drunk class is what it was. What he'd do is bring all the drunks in into the courtroom, then he'd come get somebody to come in there and give him a tongue lashing or something. And that, so he asked me to do that. So I went in there one night, right before the meeting started, there was a guy, one of the inmates, came over to me and introduced himself. And I said, well, it's nice to meet you. And then he went and sat down, and I did my thing. And after the meeting, he came back up, and he said, do you know me? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I, I just met you right before. He said, no, 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 I don't mean that. Do you know who I am? And I said, no, I don't think so. He said, have you seen me on television? No. Magazines? No. And he kind of drew himself up with a little pride, I guess. He said, well, I happen to be the most arrested man in the United States of America. <laughs> I looked at him, what do you say? I, I said, well, congratulations. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to say? I mean, <laughs> Now, I, I did not compete with his record, I, I, I would, nor care to. Yeah. But that's what happened. Yeah. So socially, that, so, that social illness of being able to function socially was the next phase of the illness. Mentally, mentally. You know, I'm told and, and I believe is that, 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 that every drink destroys a certain amount of brain cells. Now, I'm no neurologist, I don't know that, don't doubt it. I've seen the extreme examples of people who developed Korsakoff, something like that. I didn't get quite there. But I know that I was affected mentally. I got to a point that I simply could not sustain a thought. I could read something, and, I, and absolutely 30 minutes later, it was news again. There's a little good news in that. I mean, you save on newspapers. You don't need to buy but one. <laughs> Sucker's new every time you read it. I guess. But that's the way I was. I could not hold a thought. I couldn't focus. I couldn't handle any kind of, of thing. And so mentally, you know, I got absolutely just fogged up mentally. I, I got to a point that I was almost... Uh, I was, I was almost, and I'm talking about as a young man, I was almost perpetually drunk. I could drink a beer sometimes and be drunk. I, mean, I didn't have to drink a case. I could drink a beer and I'm right back. And because I just stayed stocked up so much. And, and, and so mentally, that became the normal life for me. And then finally physically. Now, I was blessed with youth. And, and, and so I, yeah, I, don't, I didn't, never didn't know if I was physically in bad shape. I was in bad shape enough. But I was never, m most of my physical stuff came from things that just got broke or beat up. Yeah, I never did uh, really fall apart much. I had the monkeys and had DTs and had stuff like that. I had the dry heaves. I became a world-class performer at dry heaves. Jesus, I just despised that kind of thing. But I, it just became normal for me. You know, gagging every time I, I brushed my teeth. That, that was normal for me. And, and being, feeling bad was normal. I mean, my God, it was just, just the way of life. And, and so physically I, I got beat up. And that, that thing of just getting almost instantly drunk was a part of that thing of staying some level of intoxication all the time. And you just start to drink and I'm gone. And, and so, you know, those things... 
were the way this thing happened with me. You know, we talk about it being an illness, and certainly it is. And it happened in a pretty well-defined kind of a way like that. And uh, ironically, recovery is exactly the opposite. Recovery has been exactly the opposite. All you got to do is just turn that right around. And, 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 and physically, physically first. Nothing happened until I got sober physically. That, let me deviate just a minute and, and, and do, because we're going to, we'll go to the ranch here for too long. But the, uh, you know, what happened in, in the course of that? Now, that's, that's an interesting kind of a thing to look at an illness in the compartments in which it develops. You know, what happens in the course of that was that I was paying for the seat that we're talking about here tonight. Because what I did in, in a relatively short period of time, you know, I started serious drinking at 16, had what I hope and pray was my last drink eight years later, eight years later, at 24. And in the course of it, totally devastated my own life and unfortunately the lives of, of many other people. Anybody, anybody that got involved with me, I, I swear to you that when I walked into AA at 24, I didn't know one human being not one, who would not have been better off had they never seen me. Not a one. Couldn't think of one person that hadn't been embarrassed, humiliated, hurt, used, abused, misused, conned. That's a, nobody. And so I looked at a life that had just absolutely devastated and been devastating in, in what went on. And, uh, and, I, and I finally, I wound up in the, right at the end of my drinking, living up up in, uh, I'd, I'd gone into military and I bounced around. I just sort of sort of traveled with drunks. Wherever drunks went, that's where I went. And I wandered up to the state of Michigan up in uh, in the early 50s up, and settled in a place called Flint, a real wonderful place. It's a, an awful lot like Jekyll Island. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a little more like Devil's Island. <laughs> Grungy place, grungy place. I swear to God, if there's anybody from there here tonight, I just congratulate you on getting out. <laughs> it's a bad place. There ain't nobody, nobody been as sober up there. That, that, but that's where I wound up, and I just went up there with a gang of drunks, wound up building, <laughs> building Buick automobiles and Chevrolet trucks and stuff like that, till I got too drunk to find the plant. And and and, so I, and, and as a as a young guy in his twenties. I became unemployable in General Motors in that town and most other places with any kind of integrity. I mean, I got to the point, I, I, I had one job pulling nails out of lumber. That was my job. And I got fired from that. I mean, that is, that's pretty bad news. And, and, then, and I went over the last year that I drank, I was basically unemployed and, and, and darn near unemployable. I used to say I live by my wits, but that isn't exactly the case. I, I live by my lack of character, and, and, and it really, I didn't consider it criminality. The police did, but I didn't. I, it just some people think it's stealing when you take stuff from folk, but not in the world I lived in. It was just the way the food chain worked. I mean, you, one day you took it from the other guy, the next day he took it from you, and uh, it was just sort of dog eat dog kind of stuff. I never thought of that as crime. Nobody did. I never thought I would do that. You know, growing up in uh, in Mayberry, North Carolina, I never knew people lived like that. And by the time I got to that point, it seemed the only normal life. At one time, it would have been totally unthinkable. But as I worked my way to that, it became the only normal life I knew. It was a strange thing to me that that way of life became so real, so normal, that anything else would have been abnormal. I'll tell you one thing that, that, that sort of a residual of that, that when I came into AA, it, it took me a good while to start thinking in terms of decency. It took me a good while to start looking for something first class. I automatically thought of the inferior. I automatically went to a greasy spoon because that's where my kind went. And so it wasn't just a matter of stopping drinking and becoming wonderful. Now, this program is a program of restoration. And uh, anyway, that, that's uh, it was, it was the way I kind of wound up. And, and, uh, 
And, and, and unfortunately, as you gathered some of the baggage that, that was going on, unfortunately, I'd, some of you are well aware, I'd, I didn't get stopped often enough and sh- or surely enough. Uh, I welcome an awful lot of people into Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and uh, I welcome a lot of people who are, who, are, who, are, who are sort of drummed in or pressed into to service in AA as a result of DWIs. You know, they'll come in and, 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 and be mandated in or whatever. And every time, I never say this to them because I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable with it, but every time I'm talking to somebody and they're crying the blues about uh, what, the, what, what the world's doing to them and uh, how bad it is to have a DWI, I find myself always thinking, my God, I would give anything on God's green earth. I'd give anything I could ever possibly have if I'd had one more. One more. Don't know how many I had, but one more would have been worth everything in the world. <clears throat> because up to a point, I did what we all do. You know, when we go out, do something wild, come in, can't remember what we've done, wake up, panicky feeling, go look at the car to see if it's there, see if there's blood on it, breathe a sigh of relief, go do it again. My God did it hundreds of times. It was normal behavior. And always it had been, everything's okay. Everything's a mess, but it's okay. And uh, one morning, I, I, I uh, came to, as in jail, and that, that was nothing new about that, and there in Flint. And after his wake a while, the jailer came by, knew him well. And uh, I said, hey, when can I get out? And he would normally say 10 o'clock. And he said, I hope never, and walked off. I had not a clue what he was talking about. Not a clue. And uh, I assumed as I was in there for the same as always. And so he walked on, and then a little bit, little bit later on, some of the other guys in there told me the night before, I'd been driving somebody's car down the main street of the city and had done the, 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 the unspeakable thing that, 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 that so many of us live in fear of. I had run down and killed two people. And... Uh, and I'm sure my response, my, my response to that was a, was a normal kind of a response. Just shock and disbelief. I couldn't, I not only, I mean, I could believe I could do anything, but I couldn't accept the information. I could not accommodate the information. And, and my response was just basically to push it away and say, no, that can't be. And, uh, and then gradually accepted the truth. The only time I'd ever been in jail, I didn't try to get out. I didn't want out. The, uh, somebody there, I don't even know who it was to this day, it's none of my business really, but I, one of the policemen there learned that I had family in North Carolina and for some reason contacted them and told them uh, they had a guy up there in a lot of trouble. And, uh, and I had a mother and sister in, in uh, North Carolina who came up to see what they could do. And they, uh, they contacted an attorney. Uh, they, I was charged with manslaughter and they... Uh, they uh, negotiated my release on bond, and, and, and I didn't know how to tell them I didn't want to get out of there. I didn't, I didn't know how to tell them I was afraid. I didn't know what I was afraid of. I wasn't afraid of drinking. That didn't even cross my mind. How could you possibly drink after something like that? I mean, my God, anybody with an ounce of sense would know that you could not drink unless you understand alcoholism. And then the question changes, how could you not drink? I didn't know that. I just knew that I was afraid to go. I couldn't face anybody for obvious reasons. I I was ashamed to be breathing. (coughs) So, uh, they came and, and, uh, and, and they turned me out. I knew I wouldn't drink. So, what do you do when you don't drink? What do you do when you're hounded by something like that? What do you do? I walked the streets all night long, lasted till about noon the next day, and then, of course, I drank. From July to November of 56, I drank literally like nobody I've ever seen. And then my last drink was actually the 19th of November of, of 56. And I, my sobriety started in February. That's when I made my first meeting. But my last drink was the 19th of, of November. And I knew it was going to be my last one for a long time. I was being tried that day. And, and I was charged with manslaughter. 
I had absolutely no recollection of the, of the, of the crime then or ever. I nev- never had any... I, might, I probably am blessed with, with not having any recollection. You know, some people say blackouts are not real, that they're just a way of not looking at unpleasant stuff. I don't happen to believe that. But it's... Uh, but I certainly understand it. You know, and and I, it, I'm sure it's a blessing, but... It, I, That, that's what it was. And, I, and, and so I started to drink from July to November and, and, and didn't even come up for air. I mean, it was obvious that, that that was just pathological drink. And I was trying to drink myself to death. That was clear. Uh, you know, a lot of people say they didn't do themselves in because of fear. That was honest to God, not a factor with me. That, that would, you know, death would have been a real relief. The only thing that kept me from doing myself in was the thought of a family having one more burden who had already had too many. And I guess in my strange, distorted way of thinking, I thought if I'm just found dead, that, you know, there'll always be a question. And I guess that made as much sense to me as anything. And any, anyway, uh, the 19th of November, I finished off a bottle of gin, and about that much in a bottle of gin. Finished it up, went down to court, it was, it was no, it, it was, it was no, no, no trial in the sense of prosecution and defense. I had no defense. I wasn't even a witness. I, I mean, they had to tell me what I'd done, and all I can do is listen. I had no defense. My attorney, I never knew there was such a plea. I'd always been in the drunk line, you know, that, that everybody just automatically plead guilty. And and he said, enter a plea of stand mute. I thought, boy, boy. Not then so much, but what an eloquent plea, eh? What an eloquent plea. You, know, you say, if you're somebody who's had blackouts, if somebody came up to you today and said, do you know what you did on the 16th of August of, of, of the last year you drank? What could you say? What could you say? Yeah, stand mute. That was, a, that was a great plea. I was found guilty, of course. And... Uh, and sentenced to a max of 15 years in the uh, in the Mississippi State Penitentiary. Now I, I knew that that something like that was going to happen, but preparation doesn't doesn't quite get you ready for the experience. When I guess I had a very normal reaction when that sentence was passed. I had an instinctive reaction of fear because I, I knew that that uh, that where I was going was not to an overnight flop in a county jail or to a stockade or a pea farm. I was going to a place. Some of some of the inhabitants of that place were my running buddies on the street, and I knew if it had people like that that in there, it was no place for folks to be. And so, <clears throat> I, I, very I guess instinctive reaction of fear, but at the same time the most real sense of relief I'd ever known. I knew it was over. It was over. It wouldn't be any more. And uh, it wasn't looking out for a future or anything like that. There was no future. I knew it was done. And I walked into that place the next day totally resigned to my fate. I, I never believed I would ever come out of there and don't believe I would have. I have absolutely no question that if I had tried to live in there with the same kind of tactics I used on the street, I wouldn't have lasted till sundown. This program not only saved me in terms of my recovery from alcoholism, it saved me just in terms of basic functioning. That never would have happened. And, and so it's, a, it's, it's truly an amazing thing to me that, that that kind of a place would be a place where something brand new would happen. The, uh, now, I wasn't looking for anything. I was a guy that, you know, I described some of those conditions that prevailed. You know, those those conditions I talked about, you might have noticed, for the most part, preceded my drinking. They were pre-existent. I was spiritually and emotionally and, and socially sick before I drank. Booze was a great solution for a while till it became the problem. And then it slammed in tighter than ever. Well, if those problems are not driven by alcoholism or caused by alcoholism or caused by drinking, they're certainly not relieved by not drinking. 
And all I did was revert to exactly who I was. I was as isolated not only by my natural state of isolation, but by the added mount, absolute mountain of guilt. You know, I had committed a crime for which there is no suitable punishment. There is none. And so I isolated totally. They put me in a cell. I sat there. If somebody wanted me out for something, they'd come and get me. If somebody wanted me to answer questions, they'd ask me and I would, they would answer. I never engaged in a conversation the first month I was in there other than just responding to, to some direct kind of a thing. And uh, one day, I, 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 a guy asked, uh, called me out for, a, for an interview, and I never knew that it was going to be anything of any consequence whatsoever. Uh, this guy, a little, a little social worker, named Martin. I, it must have been the only job he could get. I don't think he liked it much. And he was a rookie social worker out of Michigan State, that later became a, a, a semi-auto, a modern mine. Uh, but he had come to work there as a counselor. And, and, and what he did with me is exactly what they taught him in, in social work school. You interview a cat like me, you look at the history, you do some clinical examination of what's here, and you identify the clinical X and start to fix it. I, I know that now. All I knew is I'm just a dead guy sitting there. And he starts asking me questions. And, and I started answering questions. I'm sure I lied. I always did. I mean, if I was talking, I would lie. And so I'm sure I was lying. Wasn't involved in any discourse with the guy. That's for doggone sure. And when we got through, amazingly, he made the same conclusion, same diagnosis that everybody had made who ever interviewed me or diagnosed me. I've never had one diagnosis in my life. A lot of, a lot of words for it, but you're drunk. You're no good. You're an alcoholic. You're just a terrible fellow. I'd heard that. And always, before that time, it would go on to something like, why don't you quit drinking? And, and like I said, I never could think of any real compelling reason to do that. Yeah, that you know, I, I don't know if this is just a peculiarity of mine. I don't think I've ever heard anybody else in AA talk about this, but to me it has significance. You know, we, well, we talk about alcoholism, you know, the delusional quality of alcoholism. You know, I'm one who thinks that delusion is a far more difficult hurdle in alcoholism than denial. We talk denial all the time, except in the book. We don't talk about denial in the book. We talk about delusion, an inability to differentiate the truth from the false. I was a guy who never never connected the first drink to an outcome. I never connected that. Not one single time did I ever wake up in jail and say, Jesus, I shouldn't have started drinking. Or in the wrong state. Or married to somebody I didn't even know. I never said, Jesus, I should not have started drinking. I never connected starting to drink with that. I always thought the issue was that I was just a no-good guy. I always thought I was a guy lacking in discipline, lacking in responsibility, and that's truly what I believed. So, this guy made the diagnosis. You, 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 you had a lot of trouble with booze. And he didn't say you ought to stop drinking. He said, we have an AA group here and I think you ought to go. And now, I had never heard of AA in my life. That we were, I guess we were around, well, I know we were around in, where AA was 22 years old when I came in, and, and we had somewhere around 125 to 150,000 members, somewhere around that. We, uh, we were hard to count. I swear to God, we move a lot. <laughs> but we had a gang of folk, but I'd never heard of it. They didn't talk about it where I drank. And, uh, so, and I don't remember if we had any more conversation or not, but that day came and I just kind of shuffled in. I did not want to join Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't particularly want to not join Alcoholics Anonymous. I was so beaten, so beaten and docile at that point that I had no fight. I mean, I could not even muster resistance. And what I brought to, a, to the thing was, I was just like a zombie almost. I was just a guy 
who just shuffled into an AA meeting and sat down. One person spoke to me. They had an officer on the door, Ivester, yes, sir, and I uh, sat down and, and, and listened to my first meeting. And uh, it's probably a lot like yours. I, it, setting might have been different, might have been worse, might have been better, but the, the setting was similar to what most of our meetings are. A big bunch of people. There are 300 people in that group. And uh, it was a speaker meeting. And they read the stuff that we normally read. And they prayed. I knew they were going to do that. I, I knew this would be some kind of religious fervor outfit. <laughs> I knew that that had to be. You ain't going to help drunks with that. I'd never heard of helping drunks. You don't help drunks. You hit them upside the head with a blackjack. That's what you do with drunks. And, uh, and so I walked in, sat down, and, uh, and, and, and they, they introduced the fellow speaking that day. And I sat there dumbfounded. I swear to God, I could not believe what I was hearing. The, the guy told a story. I wouldn't have told anybody the drunkest I'd ever been. There's no way. I mean, that was a bizarre story. The guy was an ex-everything. He, he, everything in his own world. He'd been a professional boxer one time, and apparently not a very good one. <laughs> he was a beat-up cat. He had been a, and I tell you, it's it kind of startling to me, he had been an inmate in that prison at one time. And uh, he was a character type of guy. He was on the boxing team there. You know, he was well-known. He had a job cleaning the office building where the warden's office was. And one of the things he did was operate the elevator. Didn't go but two floors, but labor was pretty easy to get there. So they had him to operate that elevator. And, he, and, and, and his keen alcoholic mind got to working. And he decided to put a moonshine, a still, on top of the elevator. Well, I mean, he's telling this story... And I'm looking around, man, they're going to come in here with the handcuffs in a minute and get this dude. And he's telling this thing right out in front of God and everybody. And I thought, God, what kind of fool is this? Well, then <laughs> he said, it really made sense when you think about it. Because the fumes went right out the shaft, never got caught. And he said, every time the warden went to his office, he stirred it up for me. <laughs> and I'm listening. And he's telling stuff. I mean, that's mild. And I said, hey, that man, he was like a geek in a circus. I, I, I did not identify with that fellow whatsoever. Never did. He, he became my first sponsor. And I, I loved him dearly. But certainly not that day. I, he just, uh, they, what amazed me, was that I was back the next week. I didn't believe I was an alcoholic. I was 24 years old, like I mentioned. I felt as out of place as I've ever felt anywhere in my life. And I'll tell you something about, I don't need to tell you if you happen to be one of them, but I'll tell you something about isolated people. The things that many of us find as helpful strengths in Alcoholics Anonymous, for some are fear-provoking intrusions. Like the thing of, of, of holding hands. That used to just panic me when that first came. It didn't do it when I first came in, but when I started came in on, uh, uh, when I started later on, I, I hated that kind of intimate feel of connection. The, the, the notion of getting close to somebody, opening up to somebody, shaking hands, feeling warmth, I never felt that. I felt absolutely out of place here. I never felt a sense of belonging. I never felt a sense of community. I never felt a sense of identification. I'm like a guy from another planet. And the amazing thing to me is that I came back and that I continue to come back. I stayed in, stayed in there three and a half years, and, uh, and uh, then they, they, they sent me away. Never missed a single meeting. Uh, maximum custody penitentiary. They, 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 I never missed a single meeting. But you can hurry up and believe for a good while it was not because of any commitment or belief. I didn't join. i tell you the only thing that brought me back to my second meeting, and I'll always be grateful for this, was the, the magnetic personality, the magnetic enthusiasm that was just part and parcel of this guy's life. 
He was one of those rare people, and you know him as well as I do, that just have a charisma about them. Uh, they don't have to do anything. They can walk into a meeting, and the minute they walk in, it changes. It changes. The climate changes, and the spirit comes on. It's like the light comes on. I don't know what it is. It's just a sort of magnetic energy. And I know without any question whatsoever that that's the one thing that brought me back. Thank God I didn't get some old bleeding deacon that was mad at the world. And, and I doubt seriously that I would have ever come back. But I was like a guy. I couldn't have explained to anybody why I was back. I didn't have to. But I was like a guy responding to a magnet. There was a pull, and it just pulled me back. And so I sat for a good while in, the, in, the, in, that, in that program feeling totally out of place. I truly did not believe I was an alcoholic. I, I was always a reader. I, I've always been a reader. And, and uh, so I read everything we had. We didn't have much back then. About 12 publications total was what we had. And uh, I read everything we had very quickly. But there's a real difference. It's kind of like that thing I was talking about in the beginning. There's a real difference between an intellectual grasp of the program and an incorporated way of life. You know, practicing it as a way of life is a totally different experience. Because in those first several months of the program, I understood the words. I understood the activities. I understood some of the discussions. That, those were fine. That was no problem. I didn't have any sense of belonging here. And then some things started to happen that uh, that uh, we'll be getting into uh, this week. That where a new life starts, and and what is it? What is it that takes a guy like I've described a little bit here tonight? Just a train wreck of a young guy. Uh, if you can picture that fellow, 16 year old kid, fairly bright kid, bounced out of high school, 16 years old, ready to go out and conquer the world or at least find a place in it. And eight years later, that life is totally devastated. And in the course of it, has screwed up everything that he touched. Now, I was not somebody who was on the way to the frat house and, and, and had a tragic accident. No. I was a loser. I was an absolute loser. I was a guy consumed with alcoholism, I got to a point that my life didn't function. I had moments of brilliance followed by incredible periods of, of, of unbelievable stuff. I had a great ability to make good impressions on people, to look good. I've, I've had many people tell me I was the best worker they ever had three days a week. <laughs> the rest of the time, I'm, mem I'm a memory. Yeah, so I was that kind of a guy. But if you look at that thing, here was a guy that was just running totally out of control. I don't believe. I, I have, obviously I have no way of proving it. But I, I, I absolutely have no doubt whatsoever that I wouldn't have made it to 30. Guys who drink like me don't become old drunks. Now, I was just too wild. I was too chaotic. I was too absolutely reckless. You know, I, I was a guy that was like firing a bullet down the street. It was just a matter of time. Until something devastating happened with, 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 with me, and that was absolutely assured. And uh, and so here's a here's a guy. Yeah, I'm 24 years old. I'm, I'm I'm absolutely at the bottom, as low as you can possibly get. I'm sitting in a cell, almost like a guy in a coma. I'm feeling so guilty that I couldn't even imagine accepting help if anybody offered it. And somebody nudges me into Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't believe I've got the illness. I have no real interest in not drinking. I find myself in Alcoholics Anonymous. Don't know why, but I wind up staying there. How much would you bet on a case like that? Not much. I sure wouldn't. But what happened was some things started to happen. Some things started to happen with people, like that guy who became my first sponsor, like the people in my group 
who lovingly worked with me and incorporated me into that program. And then I started to find the thing that Silkworth talks about it. I've, I've, it's the only two things I've quoted tonight. We get both of them wrong, I'm sure. He said that thing about not getting too educational and professional about this thing. The other thing he said was, you know, what I've described so far in, in just a little bit I've talked about the program is sort of the fellowship level. You know, it's kind of the fellowship level. It's the thing of, of not responding well, but responding somewhat to the people around me. Yeah. And starting to get some, at least enough feeling to come and, and check it out a little bit. But old Silkworth says something in that in that introduction that he does, he says that folks, in so many words, he says that people with an illness, the severity of ours, for these folk, frothy emotional appeal won't be enough. Frothy emotional appeal won't be enough. The illness is too great. What we have to have according to Silkworth, and I believe it with all my heart, is a solution that has depth and weight. It's depth and weight. What I've found in Alcoholics Anonymous is kind of like I started out with, that I've found that wisdom in, in Alcoholics Anonymous is not about how much I know, how many facts I know, and how many books I've read, and all that kind of stuff. Wisdom in Alcoholics Anonymous is about depth of understanding. It's about depth of experience. And, and so the thing that started to turn me around is, is the thing that, that, that and, and hopefully with you, that, that we'll spend the rest of the weekend about it, is talking about how do we get past that point of coming in with a life that has bought a very expensive ticket, and then how do we turn that into a life where freedom prevails? How do I become a person that's free? Free of the bondage of self, free of the obsessions that haunt me and the demons that drive me. And what is it that makes that turn in to a life that's absolutely full of rewards and tremendous payoffs? I sure look forward to, uh, to the weekend. Thanks. Thank you.